All right, so we're reviewing the packet of the important people. So on the test, usually there's not just a question of like, who was Alfred Binet? But occasionally there are like basic content questions of what somebody was known for. Um, so either you need another name or about what they did. So I'm just going to go through these pretty quickly. Um, if you have questions about any of them as we go, definitely ask. Um, Alfred Binet, we didn't talk about him very much, but we talked about the Simone Binet intelligence test. Um, so that was one of the first ones to determine IQ. Uh, he was French, so Binet sounds French. He worked uh, with Theodore Simone to devise the first modern intelligence test in 1905. His was to determine like kids in the Paris school system who needed, who had special needs. But think intelligence test or IQ test. So if you're going to write something on there, I'd write IQ test. Uh, Margaret Floyd Washburn uh, was the first woman to hold a PhD in psych. Remember that Mary Wooden Calkins um, should have got the first PhD, but she didn't because she was a woman. So instead, Margaret Floyd Washburn got the first PhD. Um, Jean Piaget, we know him for developmental psychology. Um, he had the four stages that included sensory motor, um, ugh, pre-operational, concrete operations, and formal operations. He also talked about object permanence and schemas, assimilation, and accommodation. Those terms will show up again uh, different parts of the review. Uh, Rene Descartes, we didn't even really talk about him. Uh, he was a philosopher, though. Dualism holds that reality is composed of two entities, mind and matter, with the mind being entirely distinct from the body. Hello. Sorry. Um, Albert Bandura, we know him for the Bobo doll. He was part of the behaviorism chapter. So he's a behavior behaviorist, talked about social learning. Um, he also, one of the other things that we you may not remember him for was he talked about reciprocal determinism, um, which is the idea that you influence your environment and that affects your personality, but your environment also influences you and that affects your personality. But he was all about social learning and how we can observe observational learning and that's how we learn things, including aggression, which the Bobo doll experiment showed. Um, John B. Watson, that's a different picture of him that I don't recognize, most famous for the little Albert experiment, uh, but he's also considered the father of behaviorism, which is all about nurture only, um, but psychologist is, as the behaviorist views it, but behaviorism and little Albert experiment. Uh, Abraham Maslow, we know for the hierarchy of needs, the founder of the humanist perspective, uh, which emphasized the importance of positive growth and self-actualization. Lots of modern therapy is based off of humanism and Carl Rogers and Maslow's ideas. Hans Seeley, uh, he developed the General Adaptation Syndrome Model. Uh, our acronym for that was you are out of gas. Remember, A-R-E stands for alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. And then G-A-S is the General Adaptation Syndrome. That was the one when you're facing a stressor that you go into fight or flight, then you're actively fighting it, and then you are exhausted. Paul Broca, known for Broca's area, which is in the left um, temporal, no, left frontal lobe. Um, and that's what helps with speech production. We said if your jaw is a Broca, you can't do any taka. He had that patient who all he could say was tan tan, tan tan tan, tan tan tan, uh, because that specific area of the brain controls movement of the muscles for the mouth. Um, Carl Rogers, uh, most modern therapy is based off of his ideas of client-centered therapy, which is humanistic. It, it talks about unconditional positive regard, um, positive personal growth, um, but, but having a real true partnership, calling the patient a client instead of a patient. Um, Edward Thorndike, um, he was um, one of the precursors to operant conditioning, uh, but he did not become as famous as B.F. Skinner. Um, he had the law of effect, which basically said if you like the effects of something, you do it again. If you don't like the effects, you don't repeat it. Um, he had cats in puzzle boxes, and the cats had to figure their way out of the box, and he would give them a reward, and they would do it again if they liked the reward. Um, Lawrence Kohlberg, part of developmental psychology, um, had or studied moral development. Um, he had the pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. Um, he tested it by giving children moral dilemmas, and how they responded showed their level of moral development. Um, and we'll review those stages later, what they all meant. 
Um, but the Heinz dilemma, where Heinz had to steal a drug to save his wife who was dying from cancer, was one of those moral dilemmas. Charles Darwin, not really a psychologist, but very influential on the ideas of psychology and evolution um, and part of functionalism, the idea that everything that we do has a function and purpose um, and influenced evolutionary psychology, which is all about finding a mate and survival of the fittest, getting your traits to go on into the next generation. Um, Stanley Milgram, we talked about in social psychology um, and also I think it was in motivation, but his famous experiment, the Milgram experiment on obedience was the one where participants uh, were asked to shock another participant. They did not realize that these shocks were fake, um, but it showed how people are willing to basically do what an authority figure tells them to. And it was used to explain the Holocaust. Like why were those um, German soldiers willing to kill so many people in the extermination camps? And they just felt like they were following orders. They were being obedient. Uh, and that's what Milgram was showing. Um, one of the big things about why that was not, uh, why that was controversial was one, it was extremely stressful. And then they did not correctly debrief the participants afterward. Many of them never realized that the shocks were fake and they believed they'd hurt people. Um, B.F. Skinner, we know him for operant conditioning. He's one of the most influential psychologists. Um, behaviorism, he had the Skinner box, which is where pigeons and rats could press a lever or peck a disc, um, and then they would get a reward or the floor could actually zap them. He had the schedules of reinforcement. So those things like fixed ratio, fixed interval, um, variable ratio, variable interval, all of those were part of operant conditioning and B.F. Skinner. Um, Eric Erickson, we didn't talk about a whole lot, but he had the theory of psychosocial development. Um, they were all the ones like um, trust versus mistrust, inferiority versus something else. I can't remember. Um, role identity versus role confusion, stagnation versus generativity, um, integrity versus despair. Um, but all of those talking about um, conflicts that you face, and it was primarily directed towards males. Um, that were part of development. And we'll review those, the actual theory later. Um, Sigmund Freud, he is not considered the father of psychology, just very influential. Um, he is the founder of the psychoanalytic school, which focuses on the unconscious. Uh, we know Freud for his personality theory that involved the id, the ego, superego, psychoanalysis, which was his method of um, helping to dig into the unconscious mind. Of course, none of his research was empirical, which means we can't base it on observational data. So while he is considered extremely influential and historically important in psych, uh, his research is not considered valid. Um, Robert Sperry, we never really talked about his name very much. Rogers... I think it was Rogers and Sperry, together they did the split brain patients um, where they cut the corpus callosums of patients. Um, there was split brain Joe, um, but when people had really bad seizures, they would cut their corpus callosum and those people could still survive, but their, their brains were not connected. So for example, um, if they held something in their right hand, they couldn't verbally say it because that message couldn't go across to the other side of the brain. So I would say you don't really need to know his name, but his experiment, he won the Nobel Prize for cutting the corpus callosums. Um, William James, we know him as the father of American psychology. Um, he was the one who studied functionalism. Um, on here, it talks about the theory of emotion with Carl Longa. So the uh, James Longa was the one where they it was real backwards, like you feel the physiological part first and then the emotion, which we'll talk about that part later when we get to emotion. Um, Ivan Pavlov, he is the one who um, is considered the one who like discovered classical conditioning, but he just called it Pavlovian conditioning, um, but famous for the salivating dog um, and identifying the idea of an unconditioned stimulus, um, unconditioned response, conditioned stimulus, conditioned response. But Pavlov was the salivating dog, behaviorism, and classical conditioning. Um, Alfred Adler, we talked about in the personality unit, considered a psychodynamic um, perspective because he followed after Freud, but his key ideas were the ideas of an inferiority complex that people are constantly kind of working to better themselves. He also talked about birth order or ordinal position that children's personalities depend a lot on if they're firstborn, youngest, or middle child. 
Um, the idea of compensation, like people who are overcompensating um, for something that they're lacking, all of that was part of Adler. Um, Solomon Ash had the Ash conformity study. If you wanted to draw something, draw those like three lines. It's where they showed um, the participants a line and then there were three other lines and they said, well, which one is the same line as the first one? All the other participants said the wrong answer and they wanted to know if the real participant would lie along with them. And a lot of times they conformed and they said the wrong answer too uh, because they wanted to make sure that they kind of blended in. Um, but that was the ASH conformity study. We have another packet that shows all the studies we'll look at too. Um, Hans Eysenck, we barely even mentioned him, um, but he, he did personality. He talked about introversion versus extroversion. I would say don't worry too much about him. Carl Jung, um, he was a friend and then eventually an enemy of, um, was it Freud? Not Freud. Was it Freud? Yeah, Freud. Okay, I'm having a brain fart. Um, anyways, but he talked about, yeah, because the collective unconscious. So he agreed in the idea that we had an unconscious mind, but he believed that all of humanity shared the same unconscious, the collective unconscious. And the reason so many common symbols show up in art um, is because those are archetypes and that we share this same unconscious. Um, Franz Mesmer, I don't think he'll be on there because he talked about um, hypnosis and hypnosis is not on the current AP test anymore. Um, Noam Chomsky, this was all the way back in the language section. Cognition was the very first unit we did. Um, he talked about the idea of universal grammar um, and the idea that language determines, or yeah, language determines thought, that if you don't have a word for it, you don't think about it. Um, so that's why like the Eskimo, they have so many words for snow because they think about snow so much. Um, Paul Ekman, um, his theory has kind of been de debunked, the facial feedback hypothesis, um, that if you hold a facial expression, that it'll, um, you'll feel that facial experience or that emotion. Herman Rorschach, he kind of looks like young Brad Pitt there, um, but he developed the inkblot test, which is a projective personality test. You look at the inkblot and what you see determines part of your personality. Um, David Weschler, he, he created the WACE and the WISC, W-A-I-S, which are modern um, IQ tests, verbal and nonverbal intelligence, but IQ tests. Um, Carl Longa was part of the James Longa theory of emotion, uh, whereby emotions are the result of bodily reactions. Um, Terman studied um, with Binet, so um, Stanford Binet and IQ test. So this is what actually determined IQ was helped develop by Lewis Terman. He actually studied geniuses for a long time and they called the kids who are in his study termites. Um, but he helped with the Stanford Binet IQ test. That's the first one that gave us the IQ score. Um, Walter Cannon, we talked about the Cannon Bard theory of emotion, or I like to call it the Cannon Fart theory of emotion, that things, uh, that the information happens simultaneously, that you have a physical response and an emotional response at the same time. Uh, Robert Sternberg, this was from the intelligence section. He had Sternberg's triarchic theory of intelligence, um, said that we have three types of intelligence, analytical, which is what you would get from an IQ test, your creative intelligence, um, and practical intelligence, like being able to figure out how to change a tire on a car. Uh, we never talked about the triarchic theory of love, but it talked about how there's like emotional love, companionate love, passionate love. He just talked about there were different types of love. Um, Carl Wernicke or Wernicke, we talked about Wernicke's area, which is in the left temporal lobe. And this is for speech comprehension. So as you're listening to me talk, your Wernicke's area is helping you to comprehend my language. Um, Wernicke's aphasia um, is when people have damage and they can't understand that type of language. They can't hear or they can't understand. Um, Gardner. Um, Gardner's um, personality theory or intelligence theory. Did you need something? Yes. All right. Um, Gardner's um, intelligence theory says that we have eight different types of intelligence. Um, and they were things like um, verbal, like spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal. Um, and his justification for that was when he looked at like savants, some people are really good at some things and not good at other things. Um, that was his kind of support. He has a lazy eye, it looks like in that picture there. Um, Martin Seligman, we didn't talk about him a lot, his name, but he studied positive psychology and learned helplessness. The idea that if you have repeated failures 
Um, you eventually stop trying because you have learned to be helpless. People never try to open the doors around here because they know that they're always locked. And like, sometimes I'll actually leave the door unlocked like yesterday during testing and people will never even try to open it because of learned helplessness that they've always learned that, you know, I always try the door and it's always locked. So a lot of times they don't even try to open the door now. If it's closed, they just knock. Uh, Wilhelm Wundt, he is considered the father of all of psychology because he established the first psych lab in Leipzig, Germany. Uh, and he also did structuralism, studied the structure of the mind. Uh, John Locke, we didn't really talk about, but just the idea of tabula rasa, that we're a blank slate, which is really kind of the basis of the behaviorist perspective, that everything we do, we learn, and that affects our behavior. Um, Karen Horney, she was a feminist who disagreed with Freud. Freud um, said that we have penis envy, and Karen Horney said, nope, he has womb envy, that females have a different person perspective. Um, Herman Ebbinghaus, we studied at the very beginning of the year. He was famous for studying thousands of nonsense syllables to show um, kind of the size of our short-term memory um, and the forgetting curve, which shows that um, very quickly our memory drops off and we retain about 40% of what we've learned. Except you all, you're going to remember 95% of everything we learned this year maybe for the rest of your life, but yeah, but probably after the, after the AP test, it'll drop off and you'll retain maybe 40%, hopefully more though. Um, Sir Francis Galton, we talked about him um, in the history of psych, but he did, um, he's, his theories were of eugenics, the idea that genius is inherited, um, but, and he promoted eugenics, the idea of selective breeding, um, but his theories were flawed because early on, um, the smartest people also got the most opportunities when it came to education. He didn't consider that poor people were smart also. Um, Harry Harlow was from the developmental section. Harlow um, studied attachment theories in monkeys. He took the baby monkeys away from their real mother and gave them a wire mother or a cloth mother. Um, most of them chose the cloth mother, showing the importance of contact comfort. Um, Adelbert Ames, ooh, oh, he had a room and the sensation, um, perception, he had this room where there were three guys standing next to each other. Um, and they all looked like they were the same, or they were, one looked really tall, one looked really short. We just got to look at the picture of this one. That was the Ames room, but it just showed distortion of this room. Um, Carol Gilligan, another feminist, she disagreed with Kohlberg's stages of moral development um, because she said that males and females have different moral development, um, that females look more at um, towards fulfilling human needs and are more relationship oriented, but looked at female moral development. Um, Lev Vygotsky, also part of development, he talked about the zone of proximal development, that children have this range of what they're capable to do on their own. And then they have what you can they can do if you push them a little bit. That's that zone of potential or proximal development. And then beyond that, if you're trying to force them to do things they're not capable of, it'll affect their esteem. They'll get that like learned helplessness, but zone of proximal development. Um, Allport vaguely talked about him in the trait theory, uh, personality theories. He talked about that we have three types of traits, cardinal traits, central traits, and secondary traits. Cardinal is like what we are most known for. Um, and then central and secondary traits are ones that show up later on. Uh, Raymond Cattell, also a personality theorist, talked about we have 16 factors. Um, and he talked about crystallized and fluid intelligence. I think those show up on the confusing pairs. Uh, G. Stanley Hall had the first psych lab in America. Think the Hall of Psychology. Um, also founded the APA, the American Psych Association. Uh, Dorothea Dix, we just mentioned her yesterday because she was part of the progressive era um, that promoted the humane treatment of the mentally ill in mental asylums. Uh, Michael Gazaniga worked with Roger Sperry. Sperry and Gazaniga did the split brain experiments where they cut the corpus callosum and found that people could survive that and they it stopped seizures, but it affected their kind of their coordination. Um, Gustav Fechner, we didn't really talk about very much, but he was in sensation perception. He studied psychophysics. He was the guy who like locked himself into a dark room. And then when he came out, he thought the colors were very bright and vibrant. Um, so kind of looked at thresholds, absolute thresholds and um, difference thresholds in psychophysics.
Ernst Weber, this has to do with Weber's law in sensation and perception. Um, the just noticeable difference that says like if you have a quiet cafeteria, it only takes a small amount of noise to notice a change. But if it's a loud cafeteria, you need a really loud noise to make a change uh, in the noise. That's Ernest Weber. Um, David Hubble, um, he, his study, we didn't really talk about him very much, but he studied feature detectors in cats um, and found that we have very specific spots in our brain that detect angles and curves and faces. And those very specific spots in the visual cortex are called feature detectors. He did it by inserting electrodes in the brains of cats. Um, Weasel, oh, he was his partner. So what was his name? Hugh, Hubble and Weasel. I never remember their names. Feature detectors. Uh, Hilgard, he was on the practice test and I don't think he'd be on the real test because that's hypnosis and hypnosis has been taken out of the test. Um, John Garcia, we didn't really talk about this very much, but um, conditioned taste aversions, taste aversion in general, the idea that if you have an experience where you get sick in the future, you avoid that food later on. That was on the FRQ, I think, of the... Um, the practice test. Uh, Rescorla, I don't even know him. We talked, I guess we talked about him a little bit in classical conditioning. We'll skip him. Hopefully there's going to be people and names on the test that you don't know. And you're like, Miss Thomas never taught us that. And it's possible, um, but you can still pass and you can still get a five. Um, Tolman studied Tolman's rats. Uh, the rats were in a maze. They demonstrated that rats had incorrectly explored a maze that contained food while they were not hungry. They were able to run it correctly on the first trial when they entered it, having now been made more hungry. So they explored the maze. Um, when there was no reward, but then when there was a reward, I think it was like cheese or something later, they went really fast because they formed a cognitive map. Um, Kohler, Wolfgang Kohler, um, he had the chimpanzees. He studied insight learning where there was like a, some crates laying around and there was bananas hanging from the ceiling. Um, and they figured out on their own that if they stacked the boxes, they could reach the bananas. And that sudden aha moment is called insight learning. Um, Elizabeth Loftus studied memory recall and how a lot of people have false memories. Uh, I think we watched her TED talk about this guy named Titus, um, who he got pulled over by the cops and they assumed that he had like been part of like a convenience store robbery and it like ruined his life. So she proved how eyewitness testimony can often be false. So false memories. Um, Miller, he studied the capacity of short-term memory, which is the magic number seven. So seven plus or minus two items. That's how many numbers you can generally memorize um, in short-term memory recall. Um, Kinsey was part of the sexual motivation section. He did interviews asking people about their sexual experiences and said that uh, people's sexuality is not very clear cut, that people had had both hetero and homosexual um, experiences. So sexuality is more of a continuum and not just one or the other. Um, Schachter's two-factor theory says that, um, that we have a cognitive side of experiencing emotion and a physical side. Uh, Mary Ainsworth, this was from development. She had this strange situation experiment where kids were in a room with their mom and a stranger. Mom left and they wanted to see how the babies replied. Most babies were secure. They cried when mom left. They were happy when she came back. And Ainsworth found that those attachments carried on all the way into adulthood. Um, Diana Baumrind um, studied the different parenting styles. We had permissive, which are real easygoing, authoritarian, which is like a totalitarian dictator, and authoritative, which is in the middle, and that's considered the best one because they kind of compromise with the kids. Uh, Conrad Lawrence studied geese and imprinting, found that the first thing that the geese saw when they came out of their shells um, was they determined it was their mom, even if it wasn't their mom, even if it wasn't another goose. Um, Spearman was far part of the intelligence section. He called it the G factor, Spearman's G, which stood for general intelligence. So instead of gardeners, like eight intelligences, Spearman said, really, we just have general intelligence. And that's why people who are good in one subject tend to be good in lots of subjects. Um, Philip Zimbardo did the Stanford prison experiment um, in which all the participants were assigned the role of either prisoner or prison guard. It got way out of control. The guards were really harsh to the prisoners, but most of the prisoners just took it. Um, and when asked why they, they got out of control or why they accepted it, um, they said that they were just doing what they, the, accepting the role they thought they were supposed to play, that they accepted the role for the situation. Uh, Festinger talked about cognitive dissonance. Our example of cognitive dissonance is the smoking doctor. 
that your thoughts don't match your behaviors. She's telling people not to smoke. It's not healthy, but she tell, but she's a smoker. So it causes tension. So you feel tension because you're telling people to do one thing, but you're not doing it yourself. Um, Beck did cognitive behavior therapy. He talked about like changing people's false beliefs. <gasps> That's all the people. Yay. All right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about important studies because that goes a lot with um, what we just talked about. I can make this a little bit bigger. All right. Milgram experiment. That Again, that was Stanley Milgram on obedience. Um, the people, again, were asked to shock other participants. The shocks were not real, uh, but the learners were told to keep shocking, keep shocking. Most of them did. 65% administered the strongest shock, not ethical. Har Harry Harlow's attachment studies, again, showed the importance of contact comfort. Um, Pavlov's dog, remember that he presented meat powder and a bell that he would um, present the meat powder, the bell, the dog would salivate. Meat powder, bell, dog would salivate. And eventually the dog would salivate just to the bell. That became a conditioned stimulus. The bell is a conditioned stimulus. The conditioned response was salivation to the bell. Um, Skinner's box studied behaviorism and operant conditioning that if they were rewarded, it would continue the behavior. If they were punished, it would stop the behavior. Um, Stanford prison experiment. Again, participants said that they were conforming to the expectations of their roles, the power of the situation. Um, Piaget stages of cognitive development, um, sensory motor. That's when babies are just putting everything in their mouth. They're using their senses to touch, taste, smell things. Um, Pre-operational, that's when kids do not understand conservation. You can break the cookie into two pieces and they're excited because they got two cookies. Um, they're also very egocentric. They can only understand their own point of view. Concrete operational, now they can understand other points of view. They understand conservation. If you pour liquid into a skinny tall glass or a short wide glass, they know it's the same. And then formal operational is where you are. You can understand hypothetical situations. Um, here's the picture that goes with the ash conformity study. Um, they called the people in the study confederates. So a confederate is somebody who's like a participant, but didn't, they were in on it. So the confederates all said that the one that was the same size was like B or C. So they wanted to see would the actual participant conform. 75% were willing to give up their own opinions to fit in with the crowd at least once, even if the crowd was wrong. Uh, Bandura's social experiments, um, Albert Bandura, Bobo Doll, viewing aggression can invoke aggression in children. Um, Loftus's is false memories. Oh, I forgot to show this. The experiment was uh, where she showed people pictures of a wreck and asked them how much glass was there. And if she asked them how much glass was there when the cars crashed into each other, versus how much glass was there when the cars bumped into each other. When she said a bigger word like crash, they recalled more glass being in the picture. So how she described stuff changed their memory. So that shows how eyewitness testimony can be flawed because you can change their memory based on how you present the questions. Uh, Gazaniga's split brain research, they cut that corpus callosum. They asked him to hold stuff in his left hand and his right hand to see which ones he could say, which ones he couldn't say. Um, Seligman's learned helplessness. Um, so the dogs, some of them had been in a box where they could escape the shocks. And then when they were put into another box, they would jump away from it. Other dogs were in a box where they never had the chance to get away from a shock. So when they got in a box where they could escape, they didn't even try to escape from the shock. So that showed the learned helplessness. Uh, Watson and Rainer's little Albert experiment, um, the unconditioned stimulus um, was the, the, what do you call it, the rabbit or the rat, and the, um, no, the unconditioned stimulus was the loud noise, sorry, when they hit the metal bar right next to his head. The neutral stimulus was the rat um, or the bunny. He paired them together, eventually the conditioned stimulus was the rat and the bunny, anything furry, and his response was fear. Um, systematic desensitization with phobias. This is where they create that anxiety hierarchy. Like at the top was a picture of a spider. At the bottom was the scariest thing, which is a spider climbing up my arm. And they gradually go through the steps to overcome the fear. 91% success rate where the participant overcame their fears and did not relapse when they use systematic desensitization. 
Um, Darley's bystander effect. This was again at the beginning of the year when we talked about social psychology. Um, they found that more bystanders are present, the less likely someone's going to intervene in an emergency. Um, the story that went with that was the murder of Kitty Genovese, uh, the woman who was murdered outside her apartment. I think it was like in Chicago in the middle of the night, how nobody came out to her rescue because they assumed somebody else would. So that's the bystander effect. When more people are there, everybody kind of assumes somebody else will do it. It's part of that diffusion of responsibility. Uh, we never talked about this Pygmalion effect, self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, but that's just when you think that um, what's expected of you is what will happen to you. They found that students placed in the above average classroom showed significantly greater gains in their IQ. So basically, if the teacher told them, I think you're really smart, you're going to do really great, they did better. If the teacher said, uh, this is really hard, you don't really know any of this stuff, you're not going to do great. They did worse because it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, Masters and Johnson's sexual response cycle, remember they observed people in their sex lab and found that there is a consistent pattern that happens uh, when people are having sex. There's, I don't remember all the phases, but uh, ends with orgasm and resolution. And then there's a refractory period before it can happen again for males. Gardner's multiple intelligences, talked about those. The visual cliff study, babies crawled over this visual cliff. Um, older babies would stop and not keep crawling, showing that they had depth perception. Younger babies would crawl over the cliff, but their heart rate went up, indicating that yes, they did have depth perception, but experience tells them what to do with the depth perception. Um, Sheriff Robbers Cave Study. So the Robbers Cave Experiment, again, this was from the very beginning of the year. Um, they were at a camp. It's a place called, it's a state park in Oklahoma called Robbers Cave. There were two groups of boys um, and they made the boys hate each other. It was a very us versus them, in-group, out-group bias. And then they created problems at the camp, like the water supply was out. There was a food truck that was bringing in supplies that needed help. And when they brought the groups together, they came together for a superordinate goal and they were able to work together. So it shows how even when people are have a common goal, they will unify. Um, the Rosenhan experiment, we just talked about this fairly recently. Eight participants presented themselves for admission to a hospital by faking a mental illness. Um, and then they were had a hard time explaining that they were not. Then it showed how there was not consistency in identifying and recognizing my mental illness. Um, Rorschach ink blots. Um, you see the ink blot, you project your personality. Um, Festinger's cognitive dissonance experiment. We didn't talk about the actual experiment. I mean, that's something I never teach. People who were paid $1 for lying were more likely to report liking the tasks because they changed their opinion to justify being paid $1. I don't know. We didn't, I never even really studied this one. But cognitive dissonance, that's the smoking doctor one. Uh, Ekman's universal facial expressions. He went to people in other countries and found that we all show these expressions the same. Oh, good. We finished it. We did two packets. Yay. That's basically what review is like. It's a lot of info, but it, hopefully you remember stuff. All right. It's tiring for me. 